Our foundational text that we're going to go to in just a moment is the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 10. You can pre-mark your Bibles there. The Gospel of John, chapter 10. We're going to launch our reading at verse number 2. But I have good news and bad news. The bad news is this is the finale of our Voices series. The good news is God is still speaking and he has more to say for series to come. But this is the finale of our Voices series. The aircraft of this sermon series has finally landed on the runway. Parked at the gate, we are exiting the aircraft of this sermon series. I've been surrendered to the Holy Spirit with this series for three plus months. We've been in this thing for 14 weeks. For, like, I haven't done a series this long since Try Me in 2020. When God gave me the word try me of November 2019 and then the pandemic popped off March of 2020, I had no idea when I was being obedient to that word try me that that was my banner word, that that personal word will become a local word, which will become a national word and then a global word. So the reason we have that big 70 inch flag outside the church that's swaying that says try me is because one word from God could change everything. Just one word from God. You don't need every door, you just need one door. One word from God can change everything. And if God did it for me, he could also do it for you. And I've been striving to the best of my capability, and of course through the empowering of the Holy Spirit to give us biblical nutrients and spiritual wisdom so that we could be men and women of God who could discern better and be better followers of Jesus. I want us to recognize God has given all of us a call, but we needed to plow through voices for 14 weeks so that when God calls you, you can hear him. Whatever calling that God has placed on your life, I want you to fulfill it. Whatever purpose that you're supposed to fulfill while you're here in time, I want you to fulfill it. Whatever anointing God has poured on your life to break chains, I want you to break them while you're here in time. I want all of us to win. Whatever battle that you're supposed to win, I want all of us to win. I want all of us to eat. <laughs> all of us to eat the living bread. But watch this. I'm not responsible for making your plate. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. I want all of us to win, but I'm not responsible for making your plate. Yes, the word does work, but you have to work the word. Yeah. See, it's, it's one thing for you to say, meditate on thy law day and night. It's one thing for you to quote, blessed is the man who hungers and thirsts after righteousness. It's another thing if you actually are hungry for righteousness and hungry for Jesus. I said this all last year, and I'm probably going to say this for the rest of my ministry tenure. Information without application, no transformation. So many people want God to give them transformation. And the Holy Spirit's like, okay, with all of the information, you have no application. I understand that you have your PhD, your MD, you have more degrees than a thermostat. That's great information. But what does it matter if you have a lot of information, but you don't put it into application? Knowledge is not power. Applied knowledge is. Stop being intimidated because somebody has more information. If you have less information, but more application, you will experience more transformation. This is making sense. I want all of us to eat, but I'm not responsible for making your plate. <laughs> if you're going to have to be intentional, if you want to transition from interest to commitment, you're going to have to be intentional. Do your part. If you want to transition from being Christian-ish to being sold out, you're going to have to be intentional. If you want to transition from sometimes to consistency, Sometimes I pray. Sometimes I'll come to church. Sometimes I'll fast. Sometimes. If you want to transition from sometimes to consistency, then you're going to have to be intentional because consistency is discipline on repeat. Did y'all hear me? 
I read my Bible this morning. I'm going to do it again on tomorrow. And then again on tomorrow. Consistency is discipline on repeat. Watch this. And discipline is the diet of the next level. God wants to take us, all of us, pulpit to pew, online, in-house, overflow. God wants to take us to another level. But he has this methodology before he does it. He calls you to detox you to train you so he could send you so he could use you. One more time for note takers. This is the methodology. God calls you to detox you, to train you, to send you so that he could use you. You're called to let the Lord use you, not people. We're not here. We're about to get uncomfortable. I'm doing this in the beginning. But here it is. All of us God wants to take to another level. Oh, I hope y'all are ready for this. God wants to take you to another another level. But he won't let you board the next level with hazardous material. I want you to go to the next level. All of us have a flight. What is that? Your elevation. But he loves you so much that he won't let you elevate with hazardous material. Because not only will it hurt you, but it'll hurt everybody else on board that flight. So I need you to trust and know God's voice to such a degree when God says, okay, let me check the carry on of your soul. Because there's certain things you packed in here, you can't take with you there. That, That was cool with you. That was cool when you didn't know me. But now that you know my voice. You need to listen when I'm trying to detox you. So when God says, okay, and and, and the carry on of your soul, man, you're called, but you you, you can't take this with you. You you, you can't, you can't, somebody's, somebody's getting tight right now. Yeah, I, I called you, so you can't take this with you. I'm whatever I got to do so you can get it whatever I'm going whatever I got to do you're not going to sit under this word and say I didn't understand you're going to get it today (laughs) I promise I've been waiting for you at the door I've been waiting all week this has been in my soul So, so listen he's saying okay this was before you knew me This was before you knew my voice. But now that you hear my voice, this is trash for where I'm trying to take you. This is hazardous. I I, I don't agree with that. I I, I could do what I want. Okay, I got Bible for you. I got Bible. Okay. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. I I want you to see this real quick. It says, I have the right to do anything you say. But not everything is beneficial. Hmm. I have a right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. So when God points out something in your life that kind of irritates you and pastor holds it up, low-key triggers you, could it be because it's mastered you? When you need peace, You run to the hookah hookah. When you need joy, you run here. When you're stressed, you run here. Hear me, wherever you run is where your God is. And God is like, okay, I got plans for you. But the only way you don't allow 2023 struggles to become 2024 sequels is when I point out something that you feel is not that bad. And I say, okay, it's mastered you though, and you don't know how much it's mastered you until you try to stop it. See, that, that's it. I, I could overcome it. I could stop anytime. Try it. I don't need to prove. Okay, why not? Everything is not beneficial. Ain't you know what's so funny to me? 
For those that are like, you know, I, I don't see no problem with it. How would you feel, just hypothetically, you in there and I come in and I sit right next to you? Why is that funny? I sit right next to you and I'm like, man, what flavor is this? You would possibly feel some type of way, or it might be hard for you to digest this word that I'm giving you yeah. Yeah. when I'm doing similar activity as you, and I never understood it. Why do we expect another level of holiness from leaders than from anybody who's a Christian? Okay, we're going to deal with that later. See how quiet it's getting? Okay. <laughs> We're going to deal with that later. Let, let's, let's check out our foundational text. John chapter 10, verse 2. If you're ready, shout, I'm ready. But he, this is Jesus, he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name. This means you are not an acquaintance to me. We are intimate. I know you by name. If you ever feel you're listening to a sermon and God is talking to you directly, yes. you'd be like, Jerry, you are all in my mail. You are all. Jerry wasn't in anything because Jerry is just an instrument. If God doesn't breathe through me, I'll be up here looking like a babbling idiot. If God doesn't breathe through me, I'm not an instrument. I'm an influencer. If Don doesn't play on those keys, the keys do nothing. But as soon as he starts to play it, then you hear what was on the inside of those keys all along. So it's not that I'm reading your mail. It's not that I know what you're struggling with. It's not that I'm putting you on front street. We haven't had no conversation. Jerry doesn't use your flaws as sermon content. I can't say that for every pastor, but I don't do that. But if you ever feel like God is talking directly to you, that feeling when your ears are getting hot, Palms start to sweat, clenching your teeth a little bit. <laughs> it's because God knows his sheep personally, knows them by name. And look, look at this, and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. He goes before them. Don't miss that. He goes before them. And the sheep follow him. Why? For they know his voice. It says he goes before them. What's so profound about that? Sheep are Jesus led. Jesus goes before you. Because true sheep are led by the good shepherd. Verse 5. A stranger they will not follow. I have to exegete these passages where we'll fully get them. A stranger they will not follow. But they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. We broke down the word know is often interchangeable with intimacy in the Bible. He knew her, and she bore him a son. He laid with her and knew her, and she became pregnant. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. So he's speaking of intimacy. So sheep are not intimate with strangers. And the only way a stranger can sound strange is you must have been intimate with a voice. Because if I have no familiar voice, every voice sounds strange. Right. So, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep, somebody shout sheep. sheep. I said shout sheep. sheep. But the sheep did not listen to them. Okay. Who went before them, went before Jesus who were robbers? False prophets. False teachers. Why are they thieves? They're trying to steal my glory and steal your discernment. So when Will and I were tag teaching this series, 
and we did a whole message entitled, Beware of False Prophets. We should talk about it because Jesus talked about it. He's saying right here, sheep don't listen to false prophets. You're not going to catch sheep binging sermons from false teachers. I'm not making YouTube videos about false teachers. Why? Because I don't listen to them. Is this making sense? He's saying right here, sheep do not listen to them because I listen to the voice of my shepherd. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief, though, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came. I came that we may have life that day. Who is they? The sheep, the followers of Jesus. I came so that my children won't just have life, but have life. Somebody talk to me more abundantly. Somebody say abundant life. <laughs> He's saying, I came so that you might have life and have life more abundantly. I don't want you to miss these six pillars. These six components, these six pillars throughout this whole part of John chapter 10. When Jesus is having this conversation with his mentees, which are his disciples, he's trying to get them to get something very clear. If you could put this chart up, I want you to see it. These six pillars. Y'all say it with me. First thing is what? Shepherd. Second is what? Voices. Third? Shepherd. Fourth? Sheep. Fifth? Follow. Sixth? If you read that, study the Gospel of John, chapter 10, you'll see it's a constant mention of sheep, voices, stranger. I need you to really understand if you follow, it's because you're a sheep and because you want the abundant life. So I want to break all of these down so that we can get it clear. The shepherd is Jesus. Jesus is saying, listen, I'm the true shepherd. I'm the one that makes you lie down in green pastures. I'm the one that restores your soul. I'm the one that keeps you to have sanity. I'm the one that, the reason why you're no longer on a stripper pole. I'm the reason why you're not high outside of your mind. I'm the reason why you still have life. I'm the reason why you still have oxygen. I'm the reason why you still have pulse. Not the universe. <laughs> not the universe. I am the good shepherd. I'm the door. No man gets to the Father except through me. Not through Confucius, not through Buddha, not through Allah. It comes through me. Have to first start with me. And then after shepherd, we have voices. So I need us to get this. There are really two voices. All voices are either endorsed and inspired by the shepherd or, or they're endorsed and inspired by that stranger. The thoughts that you have about you, they're thoughts that have been inspired and endorsed by the shepherd. Or they're thoughts that have been endorsed and supported by the stranger. Because I can't believe what the shepherd says and what the stranger says at the same time. There are no neutral relationships. Stop it. Stop it. Either this relationship was endorsed by the shepherd or this relationship was endorsed by the stranger. Is this making sense? Yes. So when I brought out the hookah, could you really say, I'm going to the hookah bar because I'm shepherd led to do so? My shepherd led me. The text says they follow him. The shepherd. Ooh, y'all should see y'all faces. It's okay. We good. All right. The next one is stranger. That's that thief that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And his main methodia of how he destroys is through discussions. Through discussions. First time we see that old serpent in the Bible, he's having a discussion with Eve. 
He deceives through conversation so that, you're, that he can contaminate your decisions. He deceives through discussions so he can contaminate your decisions. The devil knows if I can get them to make decisions based on their flesh, I don't have to kill, steal, and destroy anything from their life. Their routine is going to do that. <laughs> their pattern is going to do that. Her type is going to do that. His type is going to do that. I don't have to bother them. They kill and steal it and destroy it for themselves. Some of us are rebuking the devil when you really should sure be rebuking you. That person looking at you back in the mirror, you should say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. The devil's like, I'm not bothering you. Your patterns are bothering you. Your routines are bothering you. He comes so that he could kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to get us to engage in what I call soul poisoning. Soul poisoning. What is that? That's when you are consuming stuff that God left out. So good. God left out that relationship on purpose for your purpose. Remember, he has a flight plan, and he knew that's hazardous material for your next. So I left that out on purpose. Just like you would experience food poisoning, if you left something out too long, we experience soul poisoning when we try to consume stuff that God left out. Something just ain't sitting right. Something just, I don't know what it is. Something just feel off. You are experiencing spiritual nauseousness. Your spirit is about to vomit something that God has said that's old, that has expired. That false comfort, oh, that's expired. We got this thing so backwards. We think that all comfort comes from God and all discomfort comes from the devil. <laughs> When it's actually God that will give you discomfort so you'll change. God will give you discomfort so that you'll change. God, the enemy will give you false comfort so that you'll stay the same. So God hands out crosses because I need you to crucify your flesh along with your passions and desires. Yeah, it's just so difficult. Okay, purpose stretches you. Jesus showed us that. On the cross, this is what purpose does. It stretches you. Amen. What that stranger wants you to do is label the stretching as stressing. I can't do all that. That's stretch, stressing me out. Or is it stretching you out? Because purpose stretches you. Somebody say stranger. stranger. Now sheep. Sheep are the ones that know the voice of their shepherd due to intimacy and they don't go places the shepherd didn't lead them. Sheep. Sheep. I know my God's voice. So the fifth one, I follow him. What does it mean to follow? Follow means to trust God's plans are better than yours. I trust that God's plans are better than mine so I follow his leading. See, some of us, we keep saying that I have so much anxiety, but really oftentimes anxiety is really control issues playing dress up. <laughs> that, it's not that the future is causing for you to have so much anxiety. It's your obsession with controlling it that is. I want to control how they think about me. I want to control my platform. I want to control the growth of it. I want to control them to change. Loving somebody harder won't make them change. You can't give somebody more of what they already don't appreciate. <laughs> somebody said that part. <laughs> Maybe your anxiety is so high because your control issues are so high. You're trying to take on God weight, but you're not strong enough to carry what God can carry. So just so that we can get this clear, I want you to see what are, what, what are God's responsibilities? Okay, God controls, number one, the outcome. Number two, the door. Number three, the change. And number four, the width. I'm trying to free somebody from anxiety right now. What does God control? The outcome. Not you. You can grind as hard as you want to grind, but God still controls the outcome. You can spend thousands of dollars 
on marketing, but God still controls the door. If God doesn't want it to open, it's not opening. You will go in debt trying to open a door that God is saying, that's not your room. He controls the door. He controls if somebody changes. I correct people oftentimes, Jerry, your ministry has changed my life. God did that. Because people will cause for you to be an idol if you let them. I won't let them do that to me. You will never idolize your pastor. I'm a flawed and perfect man and he's Jesus just like you. Change of your spouse, of your bae. Some of us need, well, anyway, I'm going to leave that alone to next series. Change of your spouse, of your bae, your boo, whatever. That's God's job. So watch this. If they don't know God, somebody, you need to come up here and preach, girl. They can't change. So you're asking God to change somebody who is not a sheep. And so you know what you end up doing? Shepherd dating. <laughs> you try to lead them because you think I could change them. Where really this is the ingredients of being a narcissist. Because when you can't change them, you try to control them. And then if they leave, I then try to control how people see them. This is so good. God controls the outcome, the door, the change, the width. That's how far something reaches. How far something goes. God controls that. Now let me help you see what you control so you can fully understand this. You control, number one, your obedience. I know, right? You control... Your obedience, number two, you control your effort. Number three, you control your posture. And lastly, you control your excellence. That, that, that's what you control. You can control if you're going to obey or not. You can control your effort. That's the only part. That's the only part of a grind that you have is your grind. That's it. Your effort. You control your posture. Are you a cheerful giver? Do you have a ratchet attitude? Can anybody tell that you love Jesus? Do you always walk around like something stank? Does your, does your anger shift zero to 100 real quick? Or do you have self-control where you're patient? Holy Spirit, help me my patience. He'll help you, but you have to also participate in your excellence. Whatever God gave you, be excellent with it. He has given you enough right now to do what you need to do right now. Don't feel as though you don't have enough. Work with what you have until you have enough. Because if I could trust you a little, then I could trust you with more. When I was changing ceiling tile and vacuum in the sanctuary, 10 years ago, God was teaching me excellence. And I hated it. <laughs> getting ceiling tile all in my hair and people would leave chips and stuff under the pew and I'm cleaning it and getting gum. I hated it. We ain't even talking about the restrooms. I'm like, brothers, are y'all aiming at all? <laughs> Ladies too. They, ooh. <laughs> Don't sleep. But what was God building in me? Character, integrity, and excellence. Excellent with it. But lastly, this is where we're going to park for the rest of the time that we have together for this sermonic journey. The abundant life. What is that? That's God's desired will for you to experience that you will walk into when you hear his voice and obey his word. Put the chart back up for me, guys. The abundant life. That's the part. Verse 10. When Jesus says, listen, that thief, he's come to kill, steal, and destroy. But I came so that you can have life. Not just life, but you can have it more abundantly. That's God's desired will for you and I to experience the abundant life. And this is what I'm noticing about Jesus as I was looking at this, the abundant life, I said, man, God always likes to level up stuff. Like, you're not just going to have life. Let me level that up. I'm going to make you have abundant life. I'm the God who traffics in abundant. I, I'm not just going to cause you to be blessed. I'm going to level that up. You're going to be blessed and highly favored. 
You're going to be blessed in your going, and you're going to be blessed in your coming. You're going to be blessed in the field, and you're going to be blessed in the city. Why is he saying that? This means the blessing is not where you are. It's on your life. Stop thinking, well, if I do this and if I go here, the blessing's on you. I'm going to level that up. You're not just going to be anointed. Let me level that up. You're going to be anointed and appointed. I traffic in the abundant. You're not just going to be a conqueror. I'm trying. So now I'm going to let the preach go today. You're not just going to be a conqueror. Let me level that up. You're going to be more than a conqueror. See, when you win one time, you're called a winner. But when you win over and 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 over, you're called not just a conqueror, you're more than a conqueror. To be more than a conqueror, this means winning is a lifestyle, not an incident. This when I say winning, I mean I'm winning and overcoming the things that I have been given the oil to overcome. Yes. Winning becomes my normal. When I am an overcomer, this is what God is desiring for you and I to be more than conquerors. I want you to go to the next level. But that thief is going to do everything he can to put purpose-crippling materials in the carry-on of your soul. Why? So that you can stay stuck in recovery. Let's speak around this thought from this subject for the finale of this series, No More Recovery Seasons. No more recovery seasons. Somebody say no more. No more recovery seasons. Jesus says, listen, I came so that you might have life. Can we talk, y'all? Y'all didn't say nothing. Can we talk, y'all? Yeah. Okay, so this is what I want us to get. The devil doesn't care if you have a life. <laughs> he just doesn't want you to have that life. I'm going to let Mr. Preach go today. I'm sorry. I'm going to let him go. The enemy doesn't care, and we're not a threat to hell if we have a life. We only become a threat to hell once we have that life. And what is that life? It's the abundant life. Life the king's way. Abundant life is when you're walking around with the spiritual awareness. Abundant life. Abundant life is when you know who you are and whose you are. Abundant life. Abundant life is when heaven is for you, but hell fights you. Abundant life. Abundant life is when you're not held hostage by guilt and shame anymore because now I'm held by power and anointing. Abundant life. It's when I recognize that God has not given me the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I have been given the power to tread on serpents and power to tread on scorpions, and nothing by any means shall harm me. Abundant life. It's when you recognize that no weapon, y'all better come get me today, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. We just have to make sure we're not listening to voices that has caused us to be the weapon formed against ourselves. That's made ourselves to not prosper. The abundant life. The abundant life is when your prayer and your fasting makes bullets go a different direction from your children. It makes bullets go a different direction. Why? Because death must respect my purpose. It's the abundant life. The abundant life is when through your prayer and fasting, you can tell these kind to come out. Because Jesus told us that there are certain times, certain type of demons that only come out by prayer and fasting. So when you live a life of prayer and fasting, you get another level of spiritual authority in the spirit realm. That's the abundant life. The abundant life is when you unlock doors that the enemy thought he had bolted. It's when... The abundant life is when you start to confuse the camp of hell. How didn't that divorce take them out? I'm confused. How, how didn't that betrayal take them out? I'm confused. How didn't that best friend stabbing them in the back not take them out? 
I'm confused. How didn't that rejection take them out? I'm confused. How, how did those rumors not distract her? She knows she's sensitive. How could she just ignore that and be the bigger person? I'm confused. How was he not sleeping with her? I remember in college, he used to sleep with everything that walked past. But now, no man practices purity in 2023. How was he resisting our spirit of Delilah that we sent his way because the spirit of Delilah preys on strong men? How was he able to resist that? I'm confused. How was she able to resist him? I'm confused. How were they able to not drink anymore when they used to be an alcoholic in 2015, 16? I'm confused. Why did that layoff distract them? I'm confused. How were they still praising and they didn't get the position? I'm confused. How do they still have a praise and they have a negative doctor's report? I'm confused. How is this black man still preaching this hard, sweating like that in the last four buildings that he asked God to give them, they all fell through? How is he still preaching like that? I'm confused. How are they still clapping and worshiping? I'm confused. It's because my praise and worship is not tied to my situation. My praise is tied to who my God is. I praise him because he's wonderful. I praise him because he's merciful. I praise him because he saved me. I praise him because he kept me. I praise him because he redeemed me. I'm not praising him because of what I want. I praise him that he didn't throw me away. I praise him that he gave me another chance. I praise him that he anointed me to preach and reach my generation. Let's give God an abundant praise. <laughs> I'm talking about praise him like you want walls to come down. Praise him to put hell on notice. I still got joy. I still got compassion. I still got grace. I still got confidence. I still have mercy. I'm not going to allow my situation to stop me. I'm going to praise him because I got abundant life. It's letting hell know you're going to get confused because this is not going to stop me. My praise is not tied to God's yes. My praise is tied to my God, period. My praise is not tied to what I want. My praise is tied to my God, period. If he doesn't, praise the Lord. If he doesn't, praise the Lord. If he tells me, wait, praise the Lord. If he says, go, praise the Lord. When I want it and get it, praise the Lord. When I want it and don't get it, praise the Lord. God is good even when life isn't. Abundant life. That's something to shout about. You can't stop my praise. I was like, you, you thought that that was going to discourage me? That every single building I asked and I prayed and I believed and I sought God for, I recognized if God said no to that, it's because he said yes to something else. If God said no to that, it's because of what he's trying to build in me right here. And whatever I got to get right here that I need right here, help me get it right here so that I don't get right there and mess it up. I want to get it right here. I want you to have the abundant life. Can I get us to say this confession? As loud as you can and everybody watching online, put this in the room in all caps for me if you will. Father, Father sharpen, my ear, sharpen my ear so I won't stay parked, so I won't stay parked where, I'm where I'm supposed to pass through. Recovery season's over. Recovery season's over. One more time. Father, Father sharpen, my sharpen my ear so I won't stay parked, so I won't stay parked where, I'm where I'm supposed to pass through. Recovery season's over. Recovery season's over. Does anybody believe that? Recovery season is over. I'm just trying to articulate to you this simple truth that God told me this week as I was preparing for this moment. Jerry, we were not made to bleed for the rest of your life. I bled so you don't have to. 
you don't have to bleed when I already bled. Your blood is not going to save anybody. My blood saved everybody. So inform my people when they can hear me clearly, oh, recovery season's over. You're not going to make choices that make you stay parked because now I could hear heaven. Somebody say recovery season's over. Yeah. No more recovery season. No more recovery season. No more recovery season. I feel this all in my spirit, y'all. No more recovery season. No more recovery season. No more me using a substance to get high when I have been given abundant life by the most high. Recovery season's over. Recovery season's over. Recovery season's over. No more me behaving my way into seasons and then turning around and trying to rebuke the devil for it. Recovery season's over. Recovery season's over. This time, I'm going to seek God's voice before my choice. This time, I'm not going to rush. I'm going to trust his timing. Because I can hear clearly, recovery season's over. Recovery season's over. See, when recovery season's over, it's like, it's time over and time is up for you using people, or watch this, allowing people to use you as their band-aid as they're trying to recover from wounds that they got because they don't have a prayer life. One more time. No more using people or allowing people to use you as a band-aid as they're trying to recover from wounds that they have created because they don't have a prayer life. Hmm. Unfortunately, for many of us, we've gotten used to getting used. <laughs> It's like getting used doesn't shock me anymore. Reciprocity does. Anybody? Like getting used, that doesn't shock me. I understand people want my gift, they want my time, they want stuff from me. Reciprocity shocks me. Because unfortunately, we live in a world that's filled with chronic users who love you as much as they could use you. I love how much you let me use you. But when I can no longer use you, I don't need you. Recovery season's over. Recovery season's over. Recovery season's over. That thief, he comes to steal. Kill. What is he trying to steal? I want to make sure you're never that version of you again. Remember that, that version you were before the divorce? That version you were when you were as a child when you didn't care that you didn't match? <laughs> your shirt was yellow and your pants were neon and your... Your, your, your shoes were green. All you cared was, I like it. Th that freedom of not caring about likes and follows and platforms. I'm like, God, help us remember we're called to come to the altar, not build a platform. I got these followers. Those are not your followers. Those are God's people. No more recovery season. No more Recovering due to your ambition. See, this whole, I, I, I'll sleep when I'm dead. I'll hustle, I'll hustle. Every day I'm hustling, I'm hustling. I'll, I'll sleep. That's not kingdom. <laughs> That's not. See, for those who have that grind mentality, I, I, I'm going to just keep grinding. I'm going to grind, I'm going to grind, I'm going to grind. I'll sleep when I did. I'm grind, I'm going to grind. I never quit. What if you have ambition towards something never God wanted you to? Hmm. So now your mindset of I'm never going to quit will cause you to finish something that will finish you. Mm. Maybe you started something that God never wanted you to start. No more recovery season. No more dating life wreckers. Due to me being in love with an idea more than God's will. It's, it's your idea of what it would be like. It's your idea. See, and God tried to warn you. He does. He shows you red flags. You just like the color red. What it do, baby? <laughs> He's trying to warn you. He's trying to give you wisdom. Like this quote my brother shared the other day, many of us experience has to teach us because wisdom offended you. I'm trying to get you to get wisdom. Okay. Listen, please hear me. The beauty of being shepherded is that the shepherd goes before you. 
goes before. Verse 4, in our foundational text, John chapter 10, verse 4, it says, When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The beauty of being shepherded is God goes before you. See, in military, there, there's a particular position called a point man. Okay? And what this point man does is he goes in front of the, of, in front of the infantry, in front of the platoon, and he's looking for landmines. He's looking where the enemy is. He's looking where their adversaries are. Sometimes certain military will try to kill the point man so that he doesn't go back and reveal the position. And other times they'll let him go because they don't want to give it away. But the job of the point man is to go before so that they can look, go back and inform. When the Bible says that he goes before us, it's like he's a point man. Don't sign that contract. That's not in the best interest of your future. No, don't marry that. That's from your loneliness, not your purpose. No, don't, no. That church, all they're going to do is entertain you to spiritual death. They're not going to tell you the truth. He goes before you. Is this making sense? He's going to go before you to give you wisdom. And I understand that many of us missed it, myself included. But here's the goal. To turn your wound into wisdom. When you don't allow your wound to be wisdom, you will now live with multiple injuries and stay stuck in recovery season. Every time you got hurt, you should have got smarter. Not bitter. I ain't never doing me. No, that, that's not it. I'm never doing that again. I'm like, why is everything like, there is no grace for the church. I'm church hurt. I'm done with the church. I ain't never heard nobody say I'm job hurt. <laughs> I'm job hurt. I ain't working no more. What you going to do? I'm going to be broke for the rest of my life. I'm job hurt. That food made me sick. I ain't eating no more. I ain't never heard it. That enemy kill, steal, and destroy. You got hurt by a bad one. Hopefully that could hurt you so much where you won't look for a good one. Turn the wound into wisdom. I want to take you to another level. Please hear me. What God is trying to get us to understand, I want you to come to me not just because you need surgery. I could do more than just put you back together. I can keep you together through the sermon. I love you. I will restore you. I can restore the year that the canker worm has stolen. That doesn't mean I'm going to add more time to your life. That means what I'm going to do with the time you have now. I'm going to do it so expeditiously where it's going to feel as though that season never existed. But I'm more than just a surgeon. I'm more than the God that just puts you back together. I'm also the God that helps you avoid things that can leave you broken. Okay, I want to show you this in the Bible because y'all look kind of cray cray. All right. Wisdom goes before you. I want you to see this. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 1. It says, does not wisdom cry out? And understanding lift up her voice. She takes her stand, notice the position, at the top of the high hill, besides the way, where the paths meet. Notice what the Bible is saying. Wisdom is at the high hill. Why? So you can hear me. Wisdom is at the place where paths meet. Why? Because every day of our life, wisdom and chaos shows up at our doorpost in the form of choices. Every day. Every single day. When you leave here, wisdom and chaos are both going to show up. Wisdom and rapture are both going to show up. Spirit, led and flesh are both going to show up. But wisdom is saying, I'm right there before you choose. Are y'all seeing this? She cries out by the gate, at the entrance of the city, at the entrance of the doors. Why is she not at the exit? Because she's before you go in. Shepherd before. Wisdom is before you make the decision. Go down a few more verses. Verse 34. Proverbs chapter 8. Verse 34. 
It says, blessed are those who listen to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. For those who find, for those who find me, find life and receive favor from the Lord. Watch this. But those who fail to find me harm themselves. And all who hate me love death. Hate when they correct me. You love pain. Hate when all of my business. You love pain. <laughs> Why y'all look at me like that? Right here in the text. If you find me, if you, those who don't find me harm themselves. What does that mean? You will be in recovery season after recovery season after recovery season when you have a wisdom deficiency. The reason some of us are here right now is because of pain. And God is teaching you through the pain so you won't be right here again November of 2024. This making sense. God does not give you classes to keep you stuck. He gives you classes so you can graduate. But he's not like the American school system. He won't pass you if you can't read. Y'all laughing, I'm serious. You don't get this, you're staying here. You failed the test, I love you. Here it is again. I'm not switching up the answers. It's the same answers. Same questions. You know why you take notes? It's because you're going to be tested. And when you are tested, you can have an open book test. No good teacher punishes you by a test. I had teachers like that in Westfield High School. Like, y'all too loud, y'all too. Pop quiz! <laughs> why you want to fail us? God's not like that. When he tests you, he gave you the answers already. Yeah. Recovery season is over. We must know God's voice for these three reasons. Why must we know God's voice? Why were we here for 14 weeks? It's because, number one, life is filled with demonic traps and God moments. That's why. Why must you pray? Because prayer exposes hooks. He fine, huh? There's a hook in him. She fine, huh? There's a hook in her. You just go on a happy hour. Now you're hooked. It's a hook in it. Prayer will show you beyond the bait. There's a hook in it. Because life is filled with demonic traps and God moments. What is that? Demonic traps are ambushes from the camp of hell dressed up like an opportunity that's designed to kill and steal and destroy from your life. That is a demonic trap. It's an ambush from the camp of hell that looks like an opportunity. What does that mean? It's going to look like God. It's going to look like an answered prayer. It's going to look like what you've been asking God to do. He comes as an angel of the light. It's going to look like it's the angel of the light. If we are still in a place where the enemy could just show you himself and you still fall for him, we need to probably go back to heart rehab in 2021, a whole different series. You should want the devil to have to think. I have to appear to be like God. That's demonic traps. Now, what is God moments? Those are divine occasions where God gives you a glimpse of your next and gives you, gives you instructions about your next right now. That's a God moment. It's a divine occasion where God gives you a glimpse. That's what dreams are. That, that's, a, that's a snapshot of your coming harvest if you faint not. When it's for my glory, not from your ambition though. Bible all day. Moses at the burning bush. What was that? It was a God moment. God giving him a glimpse and instructions about his next while he's still in his now. God telling Abraham, leave your father's house and I'm going to bless you and make you a great nation. What was that? That was the God moment. God was giving him a glimpse and instructions about your next while you're still in your now. Jesus interrupting the disciples while they're fishing and cleaning their nets saying, hey, y'all been fishing all night, y'all ain't catch nothing. Okay, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. What was that? A God moment. God giving you a glimpse of your next 
while you're still in your now. This series for a lot of us has been a God moment. God giving you a glimpse and instructions. I'm telling you prophetically, you're about to have a lot of doors and options come before you in the next few months. And this is going to be a note revealing time for you because you're going to recognize anything that takes me further from God is not from God. I learned that in part two of Voices. What is God doing right now? He's giving you instructions about your next. Can we go a little deeper? Okay, so God's like, all right, I have a flight. That, that's your next. But this, this, this hooker, we, we talked about it. For you, no, that, that, that can't go. That can't go. What I'm about to do in your life, you can't love money. This is fake, by the way. <laughs> so I'm like, hey, bro, this is fake. <laughs> you will go to jail if you try to use this. You, you, you can't love money. Understand that money is a means of a trade for where you live, but you can't love it. You'll lie for it, hurt people for it, embezzle for it, take advantage of people. Your whole business is built on lies where you can get more money. Okay, let me give you a Bible. Y'all looking like what? Okay, First Timothy chapter six, verse ten. It says, "For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil." Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You know what that is? Recovery season. Recovery season. So y- your love for money can't do that next level because you won't preach if your honorarium is not big enough. You won't serve if it doesn't make you a prophet. You can't love money for where I'm about to take you. I love you so much that I won't let you elevate until I get rid of everything that has contaminated your soul. Okay, well, what else you got up in there, Pastor? How about this? Why somebody whistle? Ooh. <laughs> yeah. You popping bottles, turning up. I, I, I need you to have sobriety for where I'm taking you. I don't know. That one pass. G's turn water into wine. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Okay. Uh, let, let, let's look at the Bible just so we can get some understanding on it. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 31. It says, do not gaze at wine when it's red. When it sparkles in a cup, when it goes down smoothly, in the end it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Your eyes will see strange, and your mind will imagine confusing things. Y'all didn't know this was in the Bible. You will be like one sleeping on the high seas, lying on top of the riggings. They hit me, you will say, but I'm not hurt. They beat me, but I don't feel it. You sound crazy. Okay. When will I wake up so I can find another drink? Let's read this in the Message Bible. This one was really good. I said, yeah, we're going to read that one. The Message Bible says, who are people who are always crying the blues? Who do you know who reeks of self-pity? Who keeps getting beaten up for no reason at all? Whose eyes are bleary and bloodshot? It's those who spend the night with the bottle, for whom drinking is serious business. Don't judge wine by its label or by its boutique or its fully bodied flavor. Judge it rather by the hangover it leaves you with, the splitting headache and the queasy stomach. Do you really prefer seeing double? With your sweet all slurred? (laughs) Reeling and seasick, drunk as a sailor, as a sailor. They hit me, you'll say, but it didn't hurt. They beat on me, but I didn't feel a thing. When I'm sober enough to manage it, bring me another drink. (laughs) yeah but they do it I ain't talking about them I'm talking about you stop comparing your obedience to somebody else's rebellion their life is not your standard Jesus is please hear me Jesus is the standard you will not hit it but that's where I'm aiming it's like for you you gotta be sober because I'm gonna have to trust you with too many major decisions and you can't be making major decisions drunk so that, 
For you, nah. All right, for you, bro, really, my dude? Really? This don't protect you from strongholds. This doesn't, this doesn't protect you from insomnia because you're worried about what's going to happen now that you did this. This doesn't protect your covenant. How can you carry this in your wallet, but you can't carry the cross that I gave you? And now this just happened to me. I don't know if any girls out here like this. I had a girl one day in college give me the condom. I was talking to her in the club, and she was like, so what you trying to do? <laughs> and I'm thinking, you, you NASCAR just <laughs> fast. I was turned off. I said, let me, uh, let me, let me get back at you, bro. <laughs> hey, what happened to that one girl? She quick, though. Because if you are prepared for any random person, whatever I got to do, to get my generation to get it. Whatever I gotta do. You will spend money, spend money on a whole album, get cursed out the whole time. Like you are paying $9.99 to get cursed out. And then wonder why when you're angry, you can't stop cursing. This isn't legalism. This is where I'm taking you. This, this is why I'm taking you. I have to deal with the carry-on of your soul. Why? Because I won't let you board with hazardous material. If you've ever been on a plane and you've been there and they're checking your bag and everybody's going before you, and you're like, man, they didn't check their bag, they didn't check their bag. Sometimes God doesn't let you get away with it. No. You gonna get convicted. You gonna get caught. You gonna get exposed. You, your calling is too necessary. Life is filled with God moments and demonic traps. Number three, why, we must, why must we hear God's voice? So that the thief can't steal anymore. The thief can't steal anymore. You know how Satan really steals from us? I'm going to deal with this all in the new series. He steals time. How does he steal time? By cycles. Satan can't create. All he could do is imitate. I can't construct your tomorrow. But if I can construct a cycle, get you trapped in it, your cycle will construct your tomorrow. I get you to waste your life by stealing and killing your time. I want to get you young and get you to suffer so that you're too old to do what it is that I'm trying to tell you to do right now because you don't have the strength and you don't believe anymore because he, still, he stole so much time. Yeah. Tries to steal time. Whatever God gives you is for you, for you to use for his glory and for you to keep it. Romans chapter 11, verse 20, 29 says, For the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Without repentance, that means God doesn't change his mind about your calling, even if you don't obey it. I want you to remember this. Whatever God gives, he blesses. Whatever the devil gives, he repossesses. He takes it. Five points, and we're done. How do I avoid recovery season? Number one, God first living. God first living. That's when I allow Jesus to go before me. I seek his face. I pray every decision. This is why he says, in all your ways, acknowledge me. Because many demonic traps are going to look like me. God first living. This is how you avoid recovery seasons. Number two, how do you avoid recovery seasons? Be a student of scripture. I have to say this, church. The same Bible that tells you to pray is the same Bible that tells you to study. Why are you highlight one verse more than the other? But that's my job? No, it's yours too. Why? 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. Listen, 
they will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that came from demons. You study so I can recognize the voice of my shepherd. Number three, how do I avoid recovery seasons? I don't feel significant from anything that could burn, corrode, fade, or age. I don't feel significant from anything that could burn, corrode, fade, or age. Simply put, nothing in this world defines me. Nothing in this world has my hope. Nothing in this world made me, so nothing in this world can define me. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only cravings for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what God pleases will live forever. So I don't feel significant by anything on this life. Number four, how do I avoid recovery seasons? I flee from flesh-based relationships. It's based in flesh. Flesh Flesh-based bonds are doorways to recovery seasons. Some of us, just keeping it in a buck with you, if you remove the sex, you and your boyfriend have nothing in common. <laughs> nothing at all. Steal, kill, destroy. I want you to marry for a sexual experience rather than a purposeful union. You're so trapped by how they make you feel that you don't see I'm really killing something from your life. Flesh-based. Y'all understand by flesh-based, right? Do I have to go deep? Okay. Flesh-based. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. But yes, just keep going, please. All right. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Listen, y'all. A man reaps what he sows. Whatever, whenever he sows to please their flesh, from that flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from that Spirit will reap eternal life. You're going to end up in recovery seasons for your whole life. When you live based on your flesh, the flesh will kill you. It only craves death. Get how it gets. This is the order. Sin, death. Sin, death. Understand, that's the math. Sin plus sin equals death. I don't know why pastors are afraid to preach this because of what people think. I'm like, you got to give account to God, sir. Flesh-based relationships. And lastly, we're done. Series is finished. Don't procrastinate. Don't procrastinate. When you hear God's voice, do it immediately. Remember Samuel? He ran. Remember, we talked about that. He ran when he thought he heard Eli calling him. Don't procrastinate. You wouldn't be here if I did. I'm just one flawed and perfect man. Procrastination causes for us to live in a graveyard of unexperienced blessings that have been eulogized by our excuses. I don't care that it's already almost 2024. What did God tell you to do? Start today. Start today. You never know how swiftly you need to respond because of how desperate it's needed. I was teaching Melody this. Somebody rings the doorbell. Come get daddy. Come get mommy. Hurry and come get us. Because you don't know how swiftly I might need to be informed of it. God's been ringing our doorbell all year. When are you going to answer it? When are you going to answer it? It's knocking. The day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. 
He's not going to come in unless you invite him. That's the difference between God and the devil. The devil comes in wherever there's a little crack. An open door, he slides on in. God, I come in by invitation. What is it that God has been trying to tell you? You have 14 sermons that you can go back and you can listen to for the purpose of this. I need to know God's voice for myself. I have to answer the call so I can live in my calling. And lastly, I don't want to recover anymore. Is there anybody that's there? I don't, I don't want to recover anymore. I want to advance. I want to grow. Father, thank you for conviction. Thank you for allowing us to be able to hear clearly that we must be people who are led by our shepherd. As we're living in the last days, God, it's dangerous for us to not know prophetically what you're saying. Forgive us for making us think that we have more time than we really do. Tomorrow's not promised. We're not saying that out of, out of a fear tactic. We're saying that out of what your word said, life is like a vapor. Here today, go on the next. And we want to take this moment seriously, God. Speak to us. Sharpen our ears so that we don't stay parked in places we're supposed to pass through. Recovery season's over. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.